uh, our big book discussion series held by Movement for African Emancipation on class struggle in Africa by Kwame Nkrumah. Last week, as I said, we, we just looked at chapter one, the origins of class in Africa. Um, and as a summary, at the time of colonialism, Nkrumah explained, Africa was largely communalist based, but there was evolution to more exploitative systems, such as feudalism in some places, and even development therefore characterized the development of the continent. Um, but overall, there was strong political maturity, which indicated a strong level of economic development before colonialism. Imperialism brought about the end of communalism, which was the major form of uh, economic system practiced in Africa before imperialism came. Um, the introduction of export crops led to the introduction of basically capitalism and uh, the end of communal land ownership. Um, so these land system changes created an exploited working class. Colonialism created a layer of Africans to serve in its interests using a system of indirect rule where Africans helped to rule on its behalf. And this made it possible for, for colonialism to continue to dominate the continent in a system of new colonialism by having, still having some African rulers serving its interests in the continent. So that's uh, a quite short summary of what was uh, actually a very um, detailed chapter. Um, so moving on, Today, we are looking again at class concepts and class characteristics and ideologies. So, what is class? Um, basically, what are the characteristics of class? And what are the ideologies that, that the class system brings about? So, uh, class struggle is a major characteristic of recorded history, as we saw in the previous chapter. Following communalism, class conflict developed as society forms into contending classes, one exploiting the other. So in this graphic, we have a very good representation that those at the bottom keep the, 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 the system in place, and, uh, and there's a variety of layers that serve the interests. Um, so those the the soldiers the, the army which we will look at in another uh, chapter of uh, of class struggle um the intellectuals who fool you the governing governing uh, arm who rule you and so on so the class that comes to rule does so because it possesses the means of production and distribution that is it has societies wealth and the means of creating it. Through this, it establishes its political dominance. <clears throat> On the other hand, the subject class is politically, economically, and socially dominated by the ruling class, and therefore serves the interest of the ruling class. Society is therefore divided into those who have and those who do not. Um, in this scenario, there must be conflict, right? Because if you have a situation where one one group of people is um, exploited by another, it is natural that there should be conflict, right? Um, as those who are exploited naturally resist, the nature of the conflict is influenced by development in productive forces. Thus, as the productive forces grow and one class becomes strong, it can have the power to challenge the other class. So whether or not there's a natural inclination to resist, it's also a question of how strong a class can be so it can have the power to challenge the other class. So for example, we had the, the bourgeois class developing in European feudal times and becoming strong enough, being able to acquire wealth and so on, so it was able to challenge the feudal class. Today, the working class is in a similar similar position, um, being the creators of wealth of the society, but being exploited for it. So, Frederick Douglass says, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevailed, 
prevails and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Last time we looked at some, uh, something called the base and the superstructure. Um, and in any given class formation, institutions and ideas that are associated with the dominant mode of production, each, for example, the ideas of liberalism are associated with capitalism. So we don't just we don't just have ideas coming out of thin air. Ideas come about based on how the society is organized, who owns the means of production, who therefore owns the means of the production of um, thinking and ideas, um, and that. So the ideas that dominate society are the ideas that are influenced by the by this the the ruling class and also in the, by the nature of the struggle. We, even those who who struggle come up with their own ideas in in opposition. So Nkrumah says, each class is nothing more than the sum total of individuals bound together by certain interests, which. As a class, they try to preserve and protect. So you don't just have classes, they must have interests that they try to preserve and protect. And one of the ways of preserving and protecting their interests is, is through dominating the ideas um, in the society, or trying to dominate. So there's always going to be a struggle of ideas. Um, in every class divided society, every idea, including conceptions of freedom and morality, represents the interest of one class or another. So in this graphic, we see that for the capitalist class, it believes that freedom is that everyone is free to be exploited or die and pretend to be free to say anything because what you are free to say anything unless it actually threatens the freedom to exploit of the capitalist class. For the feudal class, freedom means everyone is free to obey God and his representatives or die. The petty bourgeoisie is a class that is often in between, so it tends to facilitate and it's not quite sure what ideas to choose, though it tends to generally go for the ideas of the dominant class. But the working class, of course, freedom is to be free from this entire framework of exploitation. So since every class looks to protect its own interest, the ruling state is the expression of the domination of one class by another. So it's not just about ideas, but the state which arises, um, the, the government and so on, only expresses the domination of one class by another, um, according to Nkrumah. So even multi-party democratic systems represent the interest of the ruling capitalist class. Lenin, uh, I think, in his book State and Revolution, really expresses and explains very much what the state is in this sense. So the state, according to Lenin, is an organ of class rule, an organ for the oppression of one class by another. It creates order which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the coalition between the classes. Therefore, the oppressed are allowed once every few years to decide which particular representatives of the ruling of the oppressing class are to represent them and repress them in parliament. So, uh, Nkrumah explains that class interests prevail no matter the number of parties. Um, so, it doesn't matter if it's multi party or even one party system. So a one-party system can also represent a class unless it develops to serve the interests of all the people. Even multi-party states are to all extent and purposes one-party states. As Julius Neary puts it, the, the quote you can see there, the United States is also a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance, they have two of them. So this is the same thing in Britain for example, where even the Labour Party, which is supposed to represent the interest of the working class, has developed into a capitalist-oriented party. In Nigeria, we generally copied the American system. So we, we have these two major parties most of the time, but we don't even have any slight ideological differences or pretenses in differences between the major parties.
so the inequality created by this capitalist class can only and or by class society can only be ended by the abolition of class divisions. While there is a class division between those who own, plan, and manage, and those who perform the man manual labor that creates wealth, the class of system the class system will continue to be recreated or maintained, even when there is supposedly equality of opportunity. The individual usually finds it difficult if not impossible, to break out of the sphere of life into which he is born, says in Kuma. Even here, opportunity is only to aspire to climb to a higher level in a stratified society. Um, so it doesn't matter in the sense from the graphic, you can see that in this case, we have some sort of equality, but we don't have what we could call equity. That is usually, this is not even usually the case. You generally find that people are really at the bottom of the ladder and <laughs> not even close to the to the apple tree as, as illustrated here. Um, so then we come to what is class consciousness. We are still in chapter two, but now we've seen that there's classes, they have interests, they determine the ideas of society, they, they rule the states. So that means, in essence, that the ruling class is cohesive and conscious of itself as a class. It's quoting Nkuma. Because it has objective interest to protect and is aware of the threat posed to its continued dominance by revolt from working people. So it doesn't just have these ideas come to represent it or the state represent it. It actually works consciously to ensure that these things happen. It is conscious of itself as a class and it is cohesive. So, uh, moving on, um, we see the kind of inequality created by, by class society, by capitalist class society. Um, at the time when Kuma was writing, the ruling classes account for only 1% of the population. 80 to 90% of the population were peasants and agricultural laborers. 5% consisted of urban and industrial workers. So now we come to 50 years later, which is roughly speaking, more than 50 years. 1% um, still owns more wealth than the rest, or will soon have more than all the rest. The rich poor, the gap between rich and poor continues to widen. So just take this graphic, um, which was in 2019. Um, the fortunes of uh, the billionaires um, had grown by quite a lot from between in 10 years. Their fortunes doubled by 2.5 billion dollars a day. Uh, one billionaire can, um, has enough to be equal to the health budget. Okay, sorry, 1%, only 1% of his wealth is equal to the health budget of Ethiopia. This is crazy. Um, and the, the amount of poor, the number of people who owned the same as the poorest half of humanity, basically, uh, is only 26. In, <laughs> <laughs> as much as 3.7 billion people. Um, uh, I'm sure we are all aware of the statistics, but it's, it's just illustrating the point that even since Nkuma's time, things have actually worsened, and there are you know, many factors for that, including you know the fall of of socialist states um, across the world. Um, so, again, this is another illustration from between 2010 and 2020. The, the top 1% share of global wealth continues to grow very sharply, and the share of wealth of the, the bottom 99% continues to drop very sharply. Again, since 1995, the top 1% have captured nearly 20 times more of global wealth than the bottom 50% of humanity. In 1995, since, um, for example, um we, we you know the country's richest man will have to spend one million dollars a day for 42 years to run out of his money and meanwhile 
lots of people are poor and there's also the there's also the gender um factor there women are poorer women represent between 60 to 79 percent of the rural labor force and are five times less likely to own their own land than men um, so going back to the book Nkrumah talks about the existing class pattern of African society um, which is at the time he was writing, which is very much the same. So we have the, the peasantry, um, the, the proletariats, who are wage-earning workers, um, employed either as agricultural laborers or industrial laborers. Um, then we have the middle class, or we call the middle class or the petty bourgeoisie, the rural petty bourgeoisie which owns land and employees labor and the urban petty bourgeoisie made up of small traders and the like. And we have the bourgeoisie who are divided into upper and middle. Um, and these include not just the capitalists who, who own factories and such, but those who, who benefit from that system and, and get very wealthy out of it, including top civil servants we call compradors who are managers or senior senior employees of foreign enterprises entrepreneurs the professional and managerial class we also have uh, traditional rulers which are not um, shown in this graph but they are Goma includes them in the book who also serve the interests of the of the ruling class Nkuma discusses the wealth disparities, particularly in white, white settler states, where class is a race issue first. And to quote Fanon, you are rich because you are white, you are white because you are rich. And this is a scenario in the white settler states. Now, since that time to today, when Nkuma was writing, South Africa was, was an, an apartheid state. But even today, South Africa, Southern Africa, sorry, is the most unequal region on the continent. And South Africa is the most unequal country in the world, which is a legacy of the racist settler colonialism. Uh, just looking at it graphically, almost unequal countries in the, uh, in the world. We have the Southern African states, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, um, leading in that. Again, looking at the wealth inequality in South Africa as of 2016, uh, 10% of the population own 90 to 95% of the wealth. Um, okay, so in British controlled Africa, um, excluding the white settler states now, an educated elite developed to serve the interests of the colonialists. Africans saw white collar jobs as the way to climb the ladder and saw manual labor as undignifying for anyone with education. Though class fissures had begun to develop in Africa before colonialism, an Europeanized class structure developed with it. Class struggle has since then become intense. Bourgeois elites that developed sided with colonialism and imperialism and continue to do so, keeping the African masses in permanent subjection. In the book, uh, now we go to to the third chapter, class characteristics and ideologies. So as already implied in the previous chapter, ideologies and intellectual movements reflect the trend of economic developments. And this is a graph from the book, looking at examples of bourgeois concepts and ideologies, such as laissez-faire, elitism, individualism, liberalism, bourgeois democracy, and capitalism itself, which creates racism, as an, which is also an ideology. So certain social habits, stress, institutions, and organizations are associated with different classes. So for example, we can tell the person's class by the way he or she behaves or appears. And funny enough, it's funny to me that some of these billionaires, like Bill Gates, for example, trying to try and dress down, <laughs> but it's still um they will still belong, they will still behave in certain ways which are the ways of their class, and they also belong to these characteristic institutions and organizations 
for each class. For, so trade unions for the working class, you have rotary clubs, stock exchanges, and so on for the middle and upper class. So as earlier noted, and um, just noted again, liberalism, individualism, elitism, bourgeois democracy, and the like are examples of bourgeois ideology. Fascism, neocolonialism, imperialism also reflect bourgeois political and economic aspirations. So though they may pretend that fascism is not an ideology that comes out of capitalism, it, it is just as it's the fascistic imperialism and fascistic neocolonialism, so basically the same. So ideologies reflect class interests and class consciousness. Bourgeois ideology is expressed through the bourgeois consumption of freedom. Capitalism is equated with economic freedom and the government exists to protect private property. And it's an interesting quote um, from the aforementioned Bill Gates. If you were born poor, it's not your fault, but if you die poor, it is. This is a reflection of bourgeois ideology, capitalist ideology. Inseparable from the capitalist conception of freedom is the view, according to Nkrumah, that the presence or absence of wealth denotes the presence or absence of abilities. I mean, if you were born poor, surely it's your parents' fault. Since they were also born poor and died poor, leaving you in poverty. So I don't get how if you were born poor, it's not your fault when you die for it. It is then it was your parents' fault. And so on and so forth. Um so this is uh, just uh, an illustration of what Nkuma talks about here. So alongside the concept of formal freedom, bourgeois society also emphasizes law and order. Not minding that the law serves the interests of a class or narrow elite. <clears throat> this is, for example, we can see how Wall Street uh, bankers are never jailed for the various things they do that make that steal wealth and destroy the economy. But those who protest against it end up in prisons. This is the equality in the law, as they claim it is. In the face of revolutionary agitation, the media and political elites develop new misleading terminology as part of their propaganda, such as the silent majority or average ordinary citizen. It's a so-called silent majority. According to Nkrumah, in truth, in any capitalist society, the working class forms the majority, and this class is far from silent and is vocal in its demand for a radical transformation of society. In fact, you could say that rather than being the silent majority, it is a uh, forgotten majority that is forgotten by the media and the like who serve the capitalists. Uh, moving on, we have the African bourgeoisie who serve the interest of uh, the colonialist system. And they have confused class with race, thinking that how the white race behaves implies upper class behavior. But because the white race in the colonies were actually often working class white people with privileges, those were not the European bourgeoisie. So when our bourgeoisie imitate them, they are in reality imitating a race, not a class. They are imitating the way of life of a racial group in a colonial situation. In this sense, the African bourgeoisie perpetuates the master-servant relationships of the colonial period. So we're going to ask the question, African socialism or socialist Africa? So this uh, African bourgeoisie tends to slav slavishly accept Western bourgeois ideologies, but it has also developed its own ideologies, specifically within the African context. And these are characteristic expressions of African bourgeois mentality. Nkrumah discusses something called negritude, which I have not gone into, but anybody interested can read the book. Um, 
I want to focus instead on African socialism, which he also discusses. It's a meaningless term developed by some African leaders. The myth of an African socialism, which implies a form of socialism peculiar to Africa, deriving from its communalistic history, is used to deny modern day class struggle. It obscures genuine socialist commitment. So, that's, um, sorry, African leaders are compelled to proclaim socialist policies, but they are in fact deeply committed to international capitalism and do not intend to promote genuine socialist economic development. So they employ the use of African socialism. And this is also something to be aware of as in terms of Pan-Africanism as an ideology, you know, in terms to fall under the same kind of, um, sometimes the, you know, capitalists try to pretend to be, you know, very African, this and that. So um, it's, it's part of their own survival policies, basically, for some of them, at least I would say. So, on Krumah says, of course, there is no hard and fast dogma for socialist revolution, and specific contextual circumstances guide the application of socialism. However, the principles of socialism are universal and involve the genuine socialization of productive and distributive processes. Those who pay those who, for political reasons, pay lip service to socialism while aiding and abetting imperialism and neocolonialism serve bourgeois class interests. So that, that's uh, the end of the presentation. We'll be move, moving to discussion. Um, so, uh, I just want to, before we go ahead, uh, some guidance on that. Uh, I'm not sure, we don't think we can raise hands electronically here. Like we can do in Zoom. We can, all, we can, you know, can speak if you want to speak, please. As I said earlier, um, you see where you can request to speak or where you, where you can press to speak. So, and also you can use the chat. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, we all want to learn from each other. One thing I would uh, to guide us I would start with some guided discussion uh, questions that are um, focused on specific areas of those chapters. Not many. Um, so if you have any questions, you can please note it down. And then once we have gone through those guided questions, then we can take any any other open questions because we might end up in any case answering whatever questions anyone has while we go through those guided questions. So if you have any questions or contributions uh, beyond that, please just uh, take note of them and then you have a chance to come in once we've gone through the, the guided questions. Um, so, uh, so for the first um, question, I will try to open uh, Nkrumah says, even when there is a claim to equality of opportunity, the underlying assumption of inequality remains. Is it possible, actually, to achieve real equality or equity, and and how? So anyone can please feel free to come in. Hello. Can I be heard? Hello. Yes, please. Oh uh, yes. Go ahead, please. Is it, uh, is it possible to achieve real equality or equity? Uh, yes, my answer to that uh, is yes. How? Uh, like uh, uh, Nkrumah said uh, in the book, uh, what we would have to do is uh, eliminate uh, 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 class stratification. Eliminate. Uh, classes in, in general because uh, like as 
as that has been discussed already, the uh, classes uh, have their own uh, interests, and uh, people uh, and and the, the people belonging to their classes tend to work uh, to uh, tend to express a class solidarity amongst uh, themselves, particularly in the ruling classes, to further and to protect uh, said interests. Uh, this oftentimes uh, politically manifests itself as a for uh, as a state, and this state is, uh, as I said, uh, a moderating tool for the oppression of uh, other classes by said ruling class. And how uh, we can uh, do away with this is by eliminating class uh, in and of itself. The way we can, we uh, we can eliminate classes. Uh, by building a communism, essentially. So, and that uh, would uh, eliminate uh, any economic uh, necessity or even incentive for exploitation of a uh, man, uh, of one, uh, of one man uh, to another. Uh, so we can uh, at least put this uh, predatory phase of human social relations uh, behind us. I'm done. Um, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yep, um, I just wanted to add uh, to what Comrade um, Judy has said. Um, uh, my own position would just be, you know, in trying to be able to identify, you know, the illusion of capitalism. You know, um, you know, uh, there's this popular saying that you know, um, capitalism is about you know free market. You know, it's about giving everybody equal opportunity to do whatever they want to do in the in the, in the global market in general. But you know, the, uh, we can actually see that you know, the highest stage of capitalism is about monopoly. You know, if actually it's about equality, then you know, corporations, you know, will be buying up each other, and corporations will be you know, one way or the other times to use that advantage of you know um the enough resources that they have to acquire other small small businesses you know to able to control you know and the, the industry in general and also we can see it on 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 the national level on the international level you know whereby you know america when we had other things to use sanctions you know to old um countries like cuba countries like iran countries like venezuela you know you know that have that are one way you know practicing socialism and if truly you know capitalism is about equality then capitalism shouldn't be using you know you know sanctions to hold on old or uh, old uh, some countries you know for them not to participate in the global space in general and uh, and you know Kramer Nukrama was also saying that you know some ideas or let me say some liberal ideas are just class of ideas of some some classes, you know, when, you know, for instance, when people talk about, you know, to fight racism, let's talk about, let's preach love, let's preach, you know, togetherness among one another. So all those, those ideas, are, you know, it doesn't really solve, you know, the main problem of inequality, you know, the relationship of, you know, the different classes, you know, to the means of production. You know, when you talk, you, you tell white people to like black people, you tell black people to, to like white people but you know have you changed you know this the structure of capitalism you know how it's able to exploit you know black people's labor how black and non black being given the privilege to move from that um um how would i call it um raw raw materials producing economy you know to an industrial economy because we see how this um so-called metropolis countries have been able to monopolize the power of technology within among themselves and you know you guys talk about capitalism is about you know a free market and things like that, but the market is not free. We can we can see the the the, uh, uh, the players, you know, the class structure, you know, within the capitalist system. So capitalism can never be free, and you know, we can never have you know equality or equity, you know, under a capitalist system, except you know, we change the relationship of 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 the classes, you know, how how they how they reflect from. Um, the means of production, you know, like you said, you know, the upper class, the budget class, you know, the relationship to the means of production is that they control the means of production. 
and the middle class are just there, you know, to create the services, you know, on behalf, you know, of those that own the means of production. Likewise, you know, those that are the working class doesn't have, you know, any power, you know, pertaining to the means of production. They don't have the power of control. The only thing they can only do is to sell their labor. So if you, if you don't change the relationship that, you know, that connotes different classes, then equality can come into play. Um, that's my contribution. Good. Um, thank you. Does anybody else want to come in? Uh, do, do I want to say, okay, so concrete, concretely speaking, uh, like uh, we can't have this uh, equality of opportunity, you know, the phrase, which is the phrase used under capitalism, equality of opportunity, rather than having actually say equality, because what they, they understand that they, <laughs> they can't deliver equality, so they, they use the phrase opportunity. But um, if we were to get rid of the capitalist class, what policies or actions would we take to achieve equality? What, what is what are the things missing apart from like the power of the class uh, of the working class, for example, the expectation that the that the working class is under? What what things make inequality um, impossible? What what things can we do to bring about equality? Like what policies, for example, economic policies or social policies, would we need to put in place? anybody want to have a go at that? Uh, my, my own contribution on that question will be um, um, policies that, you know, that will Hello, comrades. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, okay, I think um, comrade Shongo is experiencing some technical difficulties. So um, we we'll have to wait for him to join the session again. Uh, but while we are here, I can see that um, there's a question in the chat by vote M that says, was there a concrete definition of class in the presentation? I may have missed it. Apologies. Uh, uh, comrade Vote, can you type in the chat to show that you're still on the call? So I can direct that um, question to Comrade Shongo. I think he's back. So if you are still here, can you please uh, type in the chat to confirm? Uh, 
Uh, okay, while we wait for Comrade and um, vote to confirm is he's, he's still here with us. Uh, Comrade Adibayo, are you, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Okay. Am I, am I there? Yeah, yeah, you can continue with your... Yeah. So I, 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 I was just trying to say that, you know, in, in able to, you know, to prove, you know, how we intend to solve the question of inequality, you know, people have to have equal access to fundamental things, you know, things like, you know, education, housing, you know, healthcare, you know, things, those are the things that reflect what equality is all about. Because in most capitalist society, we see how, you know, those fundamental things have, have, have been aligned, you know, with class structure, you know, in most for instance now you know where i'm from you know in in nigeria you know education is moving towards a path whereby you know private education will take place and public education will be scrapped out so if one way or the other the government is talking about inequality and people does not have equal access you know to 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 education that means you know the 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 the, the rhetorics about you know Education is just abstract. You don't know putting things down in concrete. So I just I just want to stop there. Uh, um, I think I lost the uh, internet access earlier. Sorry about that. Um, so I think I missed some of the conversation, the answer there. But uh, yeah, I think yeah, talking about this. Um, there's a question there, and, and I think it also relates to this. Is um, was there a concrete definition of class in the presentation? I, I think not per se, but one thing Nkuma says is that uh, in the final analysis, analysis, a nothing, a class is nothing more than the sum total of individuals bound together by certain interests, which as a class they try to preserve and protect. And in the previous uh, chapter, we looked at uh, the origins of class in Africa, and we looked at the exploitative relationship, which which is what guides the what someone what becoming a class is, you know, a class being those one one group exploiting the other for something um, that creates wealth for themselves. So in this case, the the African working class was created by taking away the land and uh, and creating uh a need for them to need to sell their labor power um to be so destitute uh that they had to sell their labor power very good example of this actually i noticed uh in, during this whole thing about the queen and looking at kenya there was an i think was it a documentary or something i watched which really looked into that in terms of how that happened in kenya where people were actually forced got their land taken off um to sell to tea plantations and uh, people who who own tea plantations and to give to those who own tea plantations and making those people destitute and they they enforce the system of taxation as well that so you had to pay taxes um so if you are going to have to pay taxes then you're going to need to look for work beyond just subsistence farming that takes care of yourself there's a way to they really have to deliberately force people to become working class so the, the, the looking at the creation of the class we can understand what the class means you know there's a class of people who own the means of production uh who own uh you know the the the, the wealth and they but they, they require a group of people to work at very low wages which is that they can barely survive on. And so they create this other class that is exploited. Um, and in that scenario, I mean, now looking at the question of equality, you you have, you've, for example, you've had struggles in the in the West where, you, you know, um, socialists guided uh, minded governments, in quotation marks, had come and insisted that there must be free education free healthcare, um, certain services, and that, that helped to reduce the gap between rich and poor in a sense. And, and it, you know, creates at least a better chance for people to, to you know, to, to live better. Um, so it, it shows you that certainly, uh, say, well, since, since all these have been rolled back, all these kind of programs, and then here in Africa, we have a scenario where we don't even have, you know, 
any such possibilities very limited um to have access to education have access because these are the things like if everybody you really was to start at the point of equality and start you, you wouldn't have people wealthier than others you wouldn't you would also have people who, who were able to be educated to be able to fulfill the potentials in themselves um to to bring out the best in themselves and uh and now you you're expected to to be rich to to have an education and, and such so um so yeah so essentially it's uh to be be aware of uh the the physiologies the the illusionary physiologies of the capitalist class using words like equality opportunity and such um so don't know if if uh anyone else has any questions that you put in the put in the chat or we'll just we'll come to other questions later just because i'll try and address that now um uh so to, let's move on i'm going to share again because i lost lost the, the lost the share that i was sharing before for the questions when i lost my internet Okay, so Kuma says bourgeois democracy, democracy, I was going to say crazy there, democracy is an illusion. What does that, what does it mean? Is this true? Anyone can free to can speak? Bourgeois democracy is an illusion. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, bourgeois democracy. Well, seeing that as in democracy that's, that favors the uh, bourgeoisie is to the, the detriment of, you know, the everyday person. Hmm. It's an, I, I, can, I can agree that it's an illusion in that it's not a, a real democracy. That is uh, the, the will and the needs of the uh, people, you know, are not represented. As the bourgeois only give, a, uh, you know, an illusion of democracy to protect their own uh, interests. Let's say like here in Nigeria, how um, essentially the citizenry has been trained. Well, like most, most citizens around the world have been trained to, you know, vote, vote their intentions every, is it two or four years? But well, that doesn't uh, uh, change the, the the realities on the ground. At least I can reference the uh, quotes that you gave, that you showed from uh, Julio Sinerere, how he said uh, that uh, the the United States has you know one party, but in its uh, extravagance, you know there are two of them: uh, the Democrats and the Republicans. Ultimately, their interests are the same, since they are all uh, you know imperialist, you know, uh, capitalists. So either ways. Whoever the um, the people you know vote in, uh, the interest of the, the capitalists are still you know protected. I can say that's how it's an illusion because um, let's say in their own context, that's in the United States, for example. Now, you know they all thought that the citizenry thought they were doing themselves a favor by uh, struggling to vote in Biden. You understand as a way to kick against uh, Trump's uh, uh, like, uh, his lousy way of governance, but still, you know there are still all those suppressive policies around the world. The militarism you get hasn't hasn't stopped. As a matter of fact, you know Africa then the uh, billionaire capitalists are still you know ravaging world markets all around. So. Well, yes, in that sense, bourgeois democracy is an illusion. It's just that when it comes to how, when it comes to the blowback, when it comes to how it's manifesting, you understand the average person, you know, inflation, you know, is real to, to the average person. So, yes, in that, you know, I would say bourgeois democracy is an illusion. But people are experiencing the, the fallout, you know, really. So, in that aspect, I can say it's not necessarily an illusion since. 
it's it's still an expression of you know the the bourgeois uh, ideology. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, does anybody else want to come in? Can I come in? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in addition to what Comrade Tobanga said, I, I just wanted to, you know, to also expose the illusion of democracy, whereby you know it's only give you know the people you know once in four years to able to give their choice about who to be in power. And you know, after that, you know people are not being you know called upon when policies are being made. You know, and we can actually see that in you know in in pre-colonial time, you know Africa you know really practiced a system of democracy that is that is quite you know. Um, abide to the interest of the people. We can see, you know, in the Igbo land, whereby, you know, before um, um, a decision is being made, you know, a representative of each household, you know, usually comes together to dialogue until they have the concessions. You know, but, you know, in Buja democracy, we can actually see that, you know, the laws only, you know, guides and uh, protect the interests, you know, of, of class, especially the Buja class. And, you know, we, we've seen, you know, as of today, you know, whereby we have, you know, in, in, in a place whereby, the practice, you know, bourgeois democracy and capitalism is very, very pervasive. They, for instance, in Africa, you know, we can see how, you know, policies, you know, you know, that reflect taking lands away, you know, from the peasantry. You know, we can see that happening in India, and also we can see that happening, happening in, you know, in Africa. You know, whereby you know, Bill Gates is trying to lord, you know, on people's land and also be able to control, you know, food security and things like that. You know. Those things are not, you know, democratic in nature, and you know, and in the most democratic, so-called democratic um, countries, you know, we see how policies, you know, put people into the institution, you know, deposit them from their lands, you know, make them into, you know, Poland trans, whereby they can only sell their labor. So, so people have to, you know, wake up that, you know, you know, democracy is just about electing people for years. It's not all about it's just electioneering, electioneering process. It's about, you know, able to have, you know, a centrality, you know, within our communities. You know, we can see what is happening in, in, in Venezuela, whereby people are being given the opportunity to have a community um, involvement you know, in government, whereby people make decisions for their communities. I think so that those are forms of democracy, whereby people have been carried along. Um, please, if I can just uh, uh, follow up, I just as with this question, I don't know. It, it feels that like, um, you know I've been doing myself, you know, an intellectual disservice if I don't bring up the realities that we are facing now in uh, Nigeria's uh, political landscape. It gets like. As this campaign is coming up now, uh, you know, with all the sensitization and the, uh, that is going on, you get political awareness is coming up, which is a good thing. But when it comes to you know the options, you know that the people are given, you know, with the three with the three uh, uh, should I say contestants or so, since it's like a pageantry for them, whatever. Everybody's. Um, and my attention is being drawn to the new uh, runner from the uh, Labour Party. That's the uh, Peter B. individual. Understand? And rightly so, you can't really you can't really question the average uh, uh, Nigerians' uh, intentions or expressions because you know how, like what what is being you know as opposed to, and for the first time in a long time, you know there is like a third force, a third actual candidate. You know, to offset the usual, uh, 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 you know, bipolar setup in between uh, the PDP and the uh, APC. Yes. <clears throat> but when we look at the activities of these individuals themselves, you know, removed from the parties, you see that they're all of, you know, the same class. And in, in essence, 
they are just uh, um, like selling us the same products, but from like different storefronts, you know. Another thing I should I want to bring up is like the, the external influence, the geopolitical uh, influence. We all saw images of uh, uh, the Labour Party representative, uh, you know, going to uh, taking picture with some British politician at uh, Downing Street. That's the front of um, the Prime Minister's residence, you know, in the uh, United Kingdom, and that's like a stark representation of new colonial. Um, should I say, it's like, it's like just a stark representation of continued new colonialism, yes, because it, it was just like a symbolic um, um, act of seeking approval or something like that. I wonder if it's just my own, uh, well, I would stand by, that is my own opinion, you understand, but that's, that's what you know, it seemed to represent, or just a symbolic uh, uh, gesture to seek approval of like an external influence, you know. Meanwhile, inside, uh, that's inside, that's in Nigeria itself, the uh, candidate, you know, is, um, you know, pushing the full interest of the people, which in one way or the other, since it's still based on the capitalist uh, uh, position, you know, would just, it, it is mostly going to uh, manifest as a pro-business um, um, administration, which would not be very, very different from, you know, what has been going on. To only be just be some kind of a neoliberal tactic to ease the the excess uh, 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 damage that is being done, you know, within the, the economy by extension to you know the people uh, on the ground. That's the that's the point I just wanted to make in this regard of you know the bourgeois democracy being an illusion. The Nigerian people are given a new quote unquote a new choice, but in essence. It, you know, it still represents the the interest of the of the capital of the hyper capitalist class because you know it's, it's they are ravaging the average citizen and uh, nothing much seems to change. It's just uh, it's a good thing that you know our, our consciousness has has risen to at least be aware of different ways to express ourselves. The voters' uh, card initiative is one thing, but you know. Political education is important to to back such a, such an initiative of. So I'll I'll hold it there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for concretizing that um, to you know the Nigerian context. Um, you know, I I think uh, yeah, essentially put that well, and I think you can see that where well. well you know, I spoke about the major parties we have had having slight, no, no, not even a slight ideological difference. I think you know we're referring to, I was referring to the two big parties, but you have a, in this instance now supposedly third party, um, again, funny enough, which is supposed to represent uh, the the third party being the Labour Party, which is supposed to represent the interest of workers, um, going to pick um, a core capitalist. To become its presidential candidate, um, and this instance, you can see that the, the the three parties or the three candidates essentially have little difference among themselves in how they see the economic arrangement in the society, um, how they see the the distribution of wealth, how they see even education. So, if we can take education for example, because I think. Education is a good example of where you might say um, governments have tried to address the question of equality to an extent, based on pressure from the working, you know, from the working classes, trying to find some reforms to, you know, to reduce dissent and things like that. And uh, over time, uh, you now have uh, the the ruling party right now. Uh, basically deciding that it has absolutely no interest in education and was not going to resolve a strike that is keeping um, students from going to university um, and it's not so different in attitude from the party that came before it, the PDP which also underfunded education and dealt with many strikes of such and if you hear what the candidate of the third party is saying you can see that essentially the belief is to privatize 
um, everything and essentially um, maintain the, the you know the capitalist new colonialist arrangement. So this is a case of people basically having no choice, even though they are they can be given the illusion that they have have choice. So the candidate of the third party comes and says, "I'm different, you know, in my character. I'm different in my competence, but isn't actually really ready." Like there was an uh, interview was interviewed on CNN and asked a very simple question: uh, "What systemic change?" He would make and in answer he basically said well, all we need is competent leaders <laughs> so um so the, 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 definitely uh he's just a different competent leader from the others who are themselves claim to be competent leaders there's no you know, he's not even prepared to speak on an ideological basis to differentiate himself and even when people pretend to do that like you have in the labor party in the united in in the in UK and Britain, it's essentially still about maintaining the the interests of the of the of a class. And I think what Nkrumah so, so has said there, as you have referred to earlier, is that Bourgeois democracy creates this idea that if the number of parties you have, the more democratic you are. If you have parties, multi-party, you have choice. You vote for this or that, and. Uh, is Nkrumah makes the point that it doesn't matter if it's one, if it's many. The point is is that it only becomes a democracy if it's in interest, it, it, if it actually acts in the interest of the majority of of the population, rather than creating illusions for them and deceiving them every few years. Um, so, and I think a lot of Africans have bought into this idea because yes, of course, we've had some. Long, long periods of military rule, but we bought into this idea that democracy, bourgeois democracy is the way to go, and it has, we have been under this experiment for many years without people really actually having, you know, you're just basically seeing the rule of money in the system, um, not really seeing how there's actually any choice or not choice on ground um, for people. So. So we should be un able to understand that yes, democracy is good, but how does it must it operate on this kind of one man one vote system, so called, which assumes that everybody is equal when in reality everybody is not, because the equality is not built into the system. Um, to if we have a system in which money and the ownership of the media is allowed to dictate the choices of people, then of course such a system cannot be good, cannot be good for us. So there are things we need to consider when we, you know, very often Africans kind of have this idea that democracy, bourgeois democracy is good. So you should ask, is it really good? Are there alternatives to it? Um, so I don't know if anybody else wants to come in or we can move on. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I had uh, like to add a few things because uh, this uh, bourgeois democracy has been an illusion. Because even if most people uh, may not, even if someone cannot articulate it, most people uh, can feel it. I believe this is uh, what is chiefly responsible for the kind of uh, 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 voter party that is a. Uh, the, the characteristic of uh, liberal democracies uh, across uh, the globe because uh, whatever happens uh, the common person is getting uh, screwed anyway like uh, however they change personnel there's not much of a correlation with uh, the way they vote and uh, how uh, policies get uh, passed uh, uh, how policies get passed so how uh, these uh, officials uh, Act. This is this uh, electionary is just this ritualistic electionary is just a way to give us that uh, illusion of choice, illusion of action, or 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 or, or, or power that uh, we really don't have uh, much of because these people do not uh, answer to us. Ultimately, this this is not a government of us because uh, since we've 
since we have already since we already understand that we exist in a class society and this this ruling class is a very distinct uh, class from us will also work to uh, further their own interests this also applies in the in, in the elections we because okay they've done a very good job to mislead us uh, on 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 the uh, political uh, action reducing it to just uh, casting a ballot that even even uh, even within that the gerrymander and uh, uh and the uh, rig in the first place but uh, as Marxists, we also recognize that this bourgeois democracy is also a dictatorship of uh, the bourgeoisie because uh, this 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 is a system they set to work for them because uh, i mean for for them it might be democratic because they have much more sway on how uh, the state uh, organs and they are, they are closer to the levels of power anyway so they are more, much more able to dictate the political uh, agendas the, than the, that we are because it is their dictatorship what can the uh, moving from uh, our current uh, position, how we can make uh, the state uh, the democratic is to wrest power from the hands of our oppressors and uh, create a dictatorship of uh, the proletariat, that is, uh, of the working people, which is uh, the vast uh, majority of uh, of uh, society. Yes, uh, indeed, and thanks for that. Um, and certainly for those who have not, uh, I would certainly recommend reading uh, The State and Revolution by Lenin, which I, I referred to there, which is very clear about um, to understand the nature of the state and uh, how it rules on behalf of the class and what it does with uh, things like democracy, um, which is in, in actuality, as you said, is a, it's a dictatorship. Um, and so, essentially, yeah, and uh, we have to think through what, what forms of system, like, like with the last chapter, we looked at African communal ownership, which was more of a democratic way of running, to, running uh, of society equitably. Um, and you, you would also look at, you know, societies like uh, had more of, of uh, people had more of a say in who who led them and what they could do to check them and so on. So we have to think away from from this system that was imposed upon us. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if anybody does want to come in. Yeah, I want to say a few things. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Your yeah, interesting contributions. I just like to add uh, what is already obvious to most of us is that, uh, yes, Kuma is right by saying that uh, democracy is an illusion. We take Nigeria as a case study. In 2015, you know, people were excited about the you know, Messiah, the Buhari, the Messiah <laughs> coming to power, that things will be better, and all of that. And, you know, over time, I think um, by themselves, they were able to discover that it's just an illusion that the power doesn't rest with them. Uh, it's the, the party and Buhari himself, the ruling party and Buhari himself, they serve an interest, the interest of a certain uh, set of people who control everything, you know. And uh, another thing is that you know, there's this uh, migration between parties, you know. Uh, the, 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 those who are in the former party, they come to the new party, you know, and how they were able to deceive the majority of us that, okay, these people were with the uh, party that has held us in, uh, in suffering for, for a long time. You know, these same people are in another party now, in a new defense system, not knowing that the ideologies of those parties are the same. And until there is a systemic change in the way we are being governed and how everything is uh, rearranged, everything can be rearranged. For example, um, decolonizing the 
curriculum, for example, because why these people are able to um, like hold us with their promises is because of the kind of education we get. You know, look at the, for example, the quote you shared, uh, 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 where the guy was talking about if you're born poor, it's your fault. <laughs> he doesn't really address the core of the issue. Why were your parents poor? Why were you born poor? And they say, oh, you have to work, that is your labor is for, is, is for hire, it's for sale. You have to sell your labor. You don't actually own it, you don't control it. You know. There's a notion of rights, you know. And, you know. For example, in Nigeria, when we we're doing the answers, we could tell that, yes, you don't have rights as citizens. Cannot protest even when there's a demo, when there is a constitution that backs uh, the right of the people to protest. You know, the same being the police, the army, and all of that, you know, kill people, and nobody was held accountable. So it goes back to the question of power that who is in control of this power? And it is obvious that it is not the people, and it's just a few elites who are in the, the control of the, uh, of the power and every other thing that governs the state. So it is indeed an illusion, but an illusion that is waiting to be <laughs> to be found out to be what it really is. Uh, you know, the people will take power by themselves. So that will be my contribution. Thank you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, I can, I, can okay. hear, I, can, I can hear you loud and clear. Um, um, thanks very much for the wonderful um, contribution. And, you know, and, you know, based on what everybody has, you know, uh, has, has talked about, you know, we can actually see, you know, the, 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 the structure of the state is only, you know, in the interest of, Know, the upper class, you know, like you said, you know, the army, you know, the navy, the police, you know, are just there getting the interest of the, you know, on the ruling class and you know, private property, you know, is being valued, you know, above human life. You can actually see that, you know, um during the ENSAS protest, you know, whereby you know people were actually being shot at, you know, because you know, um the so called I'll use the word revolutionary potentials, you know became um, aggressive, you know, attacking private property like banks and things like that. Then we see how these um, armies came out and started shooting people, you know, to be able to protect, you know, um, the, um, the the structure of, of the upper class. You know, I'm looking forward, you know, what we tend to, you know, to, to try to um, get Africa back into democracy. You know, we, are, we tend to realize that, you know, when we talk about democracy, you know, democracy itself is about, you know, in developing, you know, human beings, you know, able to meet up with their social needs and see how we can able to develop our environment in that aspect as well. But, you know, presently today, we realize that, you know, the way democracy has been structured, it's just, it's just been structured towards, you know, um, economic growth. And, you know, economic growth in, in capitalistic terms is about, how they can able to build, you know, scores, how we can able to build figures, you know, to multiply figures. And, you know, figures to them is about, you know, wealth, it's about money. You know, they don't look in terms of, you know, figures in terms of how, how many houses that they have been able to create, how many hospitals, you know, they have been able to build, you know, how many schools are they able to build. And, you know, also, you know, uh, we can see, you know, during, you know, immediately after, the, you know, the colonial era, you know, you know, you know, the leaders then, you know, majority of them were mounting, you know, development, 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 development. But in actuality, you know, in order for them to be able to gain their their presence in power, you know, they just talk about democracy and development, two rhetorics, you know. But in actuality, there's nothing on ground, you know. We realized, you know, during the military, you know, era, you know, when people were on the streets, you know, demanding for real democracy, you know, demanding for, you know, change of system. You know, but the ruling class, the so-called mil uh, military um, generals and you know, the uh, and their friends, you know, they were able to manipulate the people into, you know, a bourgeois democracy. Now in Nigeria, you know, we've been practicing democracy, you know, for more than 20 years, and there is no change, you know, between, you know, a democratic process in Nigeria and 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 when we were in the military, you know, same things still happens, you know. You know, corruption is everywhere. 
you know, people are still living in abject poverty, you know, you know things like that. So when we, you know, it's not, it's not about, you know, democracy in terms of electing people, changing faces, you know, it's about changing the system, it's about, you know, building a proper structure whereby it will be, you know, in the interest of the people are like comrade, um, Judy put it, you know, on the group, whereby, you know, the mix of production will be in the interest of the people, like a political government, you know, what we see today, you know, is the detachment of the bourgeoisie, whereby they use the structure of the state for their own interest, you know, so if actually, actually we want, you know, a good democracy, a democracy that stands you know, for the interest of the people, then the people has to hone, you know, the means of production, whereby the means of production has to be, you know, you know, in charge of, you know, advancing people's lives, in terms of, you know, making life, you know, easy to live for the people, you know, not just, you know, creating these so-called um, career politicians, you know they, you know, they care more about, you know, winning, you know, election, you know, you know, winning, winning, being into power, but, you know, they are not even changing, you know, the practical realities of the people, you know, as of today, inflation is eating at, you know, Nigeria and, you know, the dollarization, you know, in our economy and things like that. So, you know, we should be looking, you know, in towards a democracy whereby the, in the independence of Africa has to come into place, whereby, you know, nations, you know, can can break the boundaries of, you know, the colonial shackles, you know, the, the colonial divisions, whereby we can actually come together, you know, among ourselves and build, you know, a proper system whereby it will work for, you know, for the African people and also, you know, to be able to align with our brothers, you know, in, in the Americas, you know, all over the world, whereby we can build, you know, a solidified system whereby it will even, you know, put this, um, um, how let's say it, um, put back power into the hands of the black man, whereby the black man will be respected anywhere in the world. So um, that's my own contribution. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, there are some comments in there, but I just said before uh, others leave. Anyone who isn't part of MAE, please do feel free to, you know, if you would be interested in joining our group and partaking in our in-house uh, discussions and things we do, uh, do let us know in the chat and uh, um, we can get in touch or, or discuss that. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, so we've got a couple of comments uh, from votes, uh, budget democracy in a new colony is worse than an, an, an illusion. It's like, I think that goes to what uh, Dubai was talking about now. Um, I have to look at it, in fact, in our own particular context as a, as a new colony. Um, and uh, for Mubiuma, we have uh, Boja democracies also have the counter revolutionary aspect of demobilizing mass movements and reducing people. Exactly. Essentially, that's you know, why we have Boja democracies, which is to pretend to have this illusion, you know, to, to pretend to be what they are not. Um, but the, the aspect is to is to make people feel as if they, they there was there's um there's a way for them to get something and then they spend a lot of energy on it and, and so on and, and in reality then rather than spending energy on revolutionary activity. In fact, in this particular case of this current election coming up in Nigeria, this is basically the case where you you've had you are you, you are really ripe for revolution in a sense. You've had so much happen over many years and uh and suddenly you just suddenly get a candidate who pretends to be different you know from the from the others and in reality he really isn't in order to basically demobilize to take people away from from clamoring for system change for, for the real revolution that they need um so the democracy is very good at at this at uh playing this game um and we have to be aware of that in, in in our own activities and what we do in order to try and educate people um just move on and we have two more questions uh and this goes to actually what i'm just saying you know what hinders the working class and exploited people 
at times from fully developing class consciousness. How can this be counteracted? So we we looked at class consciousness, um, talked about that the, the there is class consciousness, but um, we looked at it more in this case of the bourgeoisie or the uh, let us say the ruling class. We know they have class consciousness. We know they, they know what they are interested in, and we know they are going to develop um, ways in in doing that. Does the working class do at the same level at all times? Um, so no one wants to speak to that. And if the working class doesn't, why not? If they, you know, if you think they don't, I'm not saying anything is right here, but. Um, the Nigerian working class for so long has been has essentially been uh, uh, sensitized to at least see the the material trappings of the ruling class, you know, as the the only indication of uh, success, you know. So um, and as a way to attain that level of success. The working class is also uh, subconsciously, you know, taught to replicate, you know, what the what the ruling class, you know, is doing, which by extension just means, you know, to replicate the, the systems of oppression. You understand? So, um, I, at least I, I wonder if this is something that you know you all always would, you know, would uh, be familiar with. You know when. Uh, there's you you see this this sentiment where people say, Oh my my turn rich man just chop come out. May my turn rich man just chop come out. You understand? So um because of what people like because of the, the oppression and, and dehumanization that that the working class experiences, you know, in their in their quest to to feed themselves, to clothe their families, you know, and to like seek some kind of future what they see as a solution is to just uh, uh, replicate what was what was done to them since you know they see they see you know the the, the fancy cars and the large houses as you know the only uh, indicator, indicators of their, their success you know the the idea consciously or subconsciously is to is to just replicate it and then now um congressman guys you had pointed out the ruling class, the political structures, and those in the corridors of power, they are well aware of their own interests. They are well aware of the uh, class uh, uh, structures and the class uh, uh, divisions and do everything they can to, to maintain it. And in that, in that same line, they also uh, support and even promote you know, any structures that, that would distract the working class and the and the and the masses at large. I, I well, I I include myself in, in in that part, you know, of the working class. So I'll say us, you know, to include us in to in a way of uh, you know kind of uh, distracting us. What do I mean in this situation now? Uh, even in, you know, entertainment. We look at the entertainment. We look at uh, you know our, our transport systems. You know, and so on. When it comes to the entertainment, if it's the music, if it's the uh, films, if it's even the literature, you understand? The most popular all promote a, a an individualist, you know, way of life. Or, you know, either just uh, the musicians, who, you know, just uh, are pushed to uh, or just promote this this view of enjoying one's life, regardless. Just enjoy yourself. Just whatever it is you're doing, just just enjoy yourself. And while that is something that 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 is reasonable on the surface, it doesn't take into account the realities that uh, the majority of Nigerians are, are, are you know experiencing, which is essentially a kind of a, a hand to mouth, um, um, you know, uh, lifestyle. Being that we all are existing within this hyper capitalist uh, society, you know, most people, majority of their uh, you know, monthly pay, you know, is, uh, is, uh, you know, going right back into, you know, sustaining themselves to just keep the, you know, continue the process, understand? And then when it comes to 
like uh, let's say business related literature everybody's you know encouraged to you know be an entrepreneur you understand but nothing is being said about the, the realities where captains of industry who who profess this this way of uh, living you know don't talk about the, the massive support they, they were gotten you know debt free to try their hands at various businesses <clears throat> multiple times you understand you can see let's say like the poster child for uh, capitalist success in this country is uh, Dangote if anybody's talking about any kind of wealth you, you know they mention Dangote but hardly anything is being said about his his uh, his like his origins as from the the Dantata Dan legacy the pyramids of groundnuts that we used to see on the nanos in those days you know he is as a he is as a result of that that generational wealth. You understand, and it has also just given him the leeway to tap into other industries, essentially like a, a, you know feeding, and uh, now with the uh, refinery projects that are going on, all going to a single person. You know, we look at the those the captains of industry, in telecoms, they are all you know uh, descendants of generational wealth. We look at the agriculture, let's say like palm oil. We know that those ones have their their uh, wealth connected to the uh, colonial trade. You know when Britain and all those European countries were harvesting you know oil for their machines during their age of industrialization. So the ruling class of Nigeria are fully aware of their interest and do all they can to you know protect it <clears throat> by mainly distracting the working class. And even the lumpen, you know, proletariats uh, uh, that have, you know, completely fallen through the cracks. You understand? So, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I hope I'm not rambling, but I've lost track of the uh, the, the question. That you know, the, since since the the uh, the working class, you know, sees what the ruling class does as the only way to uh, a success, it's difficult for there to be solidarity. Because of that, because of the supremacy that uh, uh, individualist ideology has in this in this uh, uh, society, this our Nigeria. Like so, yes, I'll, I'll stop there. For you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and certainly, uh, given some some explanations of why you know people end up not having that solidarity, because of course we are operating in. in um, under the domination of one class that that controls the the means of um, intellectual creation, the media, education, and the like, history. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, jump in. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, like uh, like uh, we've already articulated, uh, the main one of the main obstacles of. Uh, Toward class uh, consciousness is uh, the bourgeois uh, indoctrination uh, that we have, because they, the the, the ruling classes, enjoy almost complete uh, control over spheres of uh, influence uh, and uh, information uh, in society, be it uh, uh, the, the 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 educational uh, system, be it uh, the media you consume or what uh, you hear in uh, the ubiquitous uh, religious uh, institutions. And even just besides uh, what uh, they put in our brains, where the social relations uh, facilitated under this uh, inherently capital exploitative uh, capitalist uh, system incentivizes uh, it incentivizes exploitation, incentivizes uh, dishonesty. It, 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 it brings out uh, the worst of us. So it brings out the worst, uh, the, the worst of us, and the rewards the best of us are being the worst of us. And uh, for, for for like uh, like the, the saying goes, there's no ethical uh, consumption under capitalism. Like we we need to survive uh, uh, at the end of the day. And uh, oftentimes we would be faced with uh, we would be put in the uh, uncomfortable uh, situations uh, uh, situations where we'd rather not be uh, anyway where we might have to screw someone over yeah in some way just to just just to uh get by 
they 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 also very fond of uh, co opting uh, or or hijacking uh, revolutionary uh, movements or ideas uh, just just to like uh, take uh, just diffuse uh, some of uh, the uh, inevitable uh, uh, civil unrest that would uh, uh, come about because uh, you can't uh, yeah, ex exploit uh, the uh, mass of uh, society into uh, uh, perpetually. That's uh, not possible. So they they would uh, 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 they they would always uh, try and diffuse and uh, mislead you once 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 they see. Uh, was a get we get wind of a rising uh, class consciousness when uh, people start uh, asking questions, and uh, the and there's also a lot of a uh, sloganeering because uh, they want us to have a uh, they, they they don't want us to have a, a contextual or systemic uh, understanding of uh, situations like uh, everything that happens. Uh, uh, is is a result of a uh, dialectic uh, relationship between the uh, causes uh, and uh, and their effects. They will say things. They will say very vague, perhaps ostensibly nice words like uh, freedom or change or next level. They are just to carry with uh, without any proper grounded explanation or ideology for us to. At least uh, the, the, the direct our, our energies behind. They will never address uh, the economic uh, and material conditions that underscore all of these because uh, they will never bring to your attention that, uh, uh, or, or, or have you thinking in the lines of, oh, why are you poor? You are poor, you, you, you guys are poor because uh, the system prioritizes the super profits of a, of a few. Uh, uh, privileged uh, shareholders at the expense, uh, but uh, at the expense of uh, the rest of uh, society, or, or 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 why some of these people need uh, guaranteed uh, markets to exploit so that they can continue uh, raking in uh, said profits, uh, profits, or why or uh, something like unemployment is 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 is, is, a, is a weapon of theirs. It's a that 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 <laughs> that serves uh, multiple uh, functions. I mean, on one hand, it uh, it's a way for them to uh, fight, uh, reduce uh, the wages of, of 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 workers. I mean, yeah, we, we, we've been proletarianized and we're wage slaves anyway. But they also want to reduce. They they they, they would like to get away with as little as they would have to pay us as they could get, as they can get away with, and uh, they, they 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 are. And they are constantly working uh, tirelessly to that end. Or why they they, they need a reserve uh, army of uh, unemployed uh, people. So it's it's also much easier to threaten you uh, to 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 accept uh, dehumanizing and undignifying uh, work conditions because they, they they are sure of a of a cache of people even more desperate. Uh, than you, and I would uh, accept uh, uh, those conditions anyway. Or why uh, uh, they, 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 they will want to privatize all aspects uh, of so privatize and qualify all aspects of society? Why uh, structural adjustment programs like their, their control, the demolition of the, the public sector, where they sell it to their friends at uh, giveaway prices so that they, they can reap uh, more profits uh, and, and so on and so forth. So yes, we have, they, they have uh, very successfully bamboozled us with uh, their, with uh, their ideology. I mean, this, 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 this uh, works that we, we, we need to uh, counter them because first of all, we have to educate ourselves. Our, your enemy will not give you the tools uh, to destroy them. <laughs> One of the first uh, tools is uh, your, your education. Once they can control your thoughts, they, they they have very they have almost no reason to fear anything you will do. You, even if you believe you are, are making progress, you you will ultimately act in a way that is self destructive towards you because uh, a lot of those thoughts aren't even yeah, yours to begin with. They've been very carefully shaped from as soon as you went to school, 
and it, uh, and, and and you continue you will be continually propagandized uh, for for the rest of your life. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. Um, yeah, also, thank I you. Just... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to add to what the two comments already said. Uh, um, for, for me, I feel like you know it's it's a systemic thing. You know, people do uh, the vast majority of Nigerians or the vast majority of African people don't, don't understand you know their class interests or don't don't see themselves you know as as a part of class you know that is systematically being made you know and you know the reflection of the political leaders we have in this in in, in africa or in nigeria has been you know the legacy of colonialism you know the puppets being put in power and this so-called puppet understand you know how you know the unions you know as a, during the colonial time was we are able you know to fight as a class you know to question you know the colonial administrative like in nigeria you know we see you know the coal miners you know we are able you know to go on strike you know go on mass agitations you know to fight for their own interests and those agitations you know led into an anti-colonial movement in able to disrupt you know you know colonial um um, government, you know, in in Nigeria and Africa. So, you know, over time, you know, this so-called puppet that we that later have in post post colonial um, um, era, you know, understand, you know, the impact of if if the people could understand the class that they are, you know, they were able to come together, you know, and fight, you know, uh, you know, among themselves, you know, fight together to, to fight against the system. And like, you know, we're going to be able to see how the military government, you know, were able to dismantle, you know, the power you know, of the unions that we have in this country. They were able to infiltrate it, you know, created a, a new labor whereby the labor, all the unions were being attached into one a big, big um, umbrella. And you know they were able to infiltrate it and put their so-called people, people who are the labor bureaucrats that we have today, those that doesn't align, they doesn't have the interest that aligned, you know, with the really with the with the rack and file, you know, of the unions that we have today. And we have seen, you know, how these people have been able to also infiltrate, you know, our schools, the so-called military, using their own agents, you know, and also um, secret service agencies, you know, to penetrate our schools, whereby. You know, they clamp down on radical organizations that they are, they, that that we are bringing, you know, class educations, you know, among the students, make them understand, you know, how um, the class functions, you know, able to 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 dictate, you know, how people live in mass poverty and things like that. And we can also see, you know, the role, you know, uni um, the students' movement and the union split, you know, when the military government of Babangida you know, brought out a poll if people should, should vote to accept the IMF loan. And the mass majority of the Nigerian people voted against, you know, the IMF loan because they understood, you know, how it's going to reflect on their day-to-day -day, you know, life activities, you know, issue of inflation and things like that. So when I feel like, you know, this so-called ruling class has been able to perpetrate, you know, breaking the class consciousness on our people. And also as of today, we will see how, you know, the so-called religious institutions as you know played a role in that aspect too because people don't actually see things on how the economic is being structured you know why people live in abject poverty you know majority of people still accept you know this messism and things like that that if you are poor it's based on um having um individualistic problems and why people don't actually see it as part of a social you know, deficiency. And the reason why you are poor is because this thing has been deprived from you. This system is not actually working, you know, to aid, you know, your own progress, you know, as an individual within the society. And that's why you say that today, you know, the so-called polit political leaders that we have today can actually talk about privatization publicly, you know, and people don't really understand, you know, how this thing affects them. So it's still part of, you know, you know, why we need to keep educating the people to be able to understand, you know, the class concept, you know, to understand, you know, how you know, the so-called ruling class has been able to take the dividends of social labor, you know, why, you know, for instance, like, like comment, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name, said, you know, we have people like Dangote, you know, load on, load on people's, you know, labor and it packs the mass, the mass, the mass, you know surplus that they, that they see for 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 their labor so these are part of the reason that people don't see things and you know you go to our schools today you know majority of what they've been taught to school are the reflections 
you know, of capitalist ideas. You know, a lot of people believe that, you know, to be rich, you have to exploit people. So if they have been exploited, they see that that is the pattern. So for them to, to also be rich, they have to exploit to certain people. But one way or the other, you know, you know, we, we've seen it like there's this popular, um, I, I've forgotten, like, you know, um, there's this popular saying that, you know, you know, it's, it's more easier for you to win a lottery than to win, that, than to move out of your own class. No, that's that that shows you know the reflection of how this you know super rich as able to create a structure whereby they can keep you know, accumulating wealth while the vast majority live in poverty. Uh, that's my contribution. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just round up on this question there because we still have another question to go through. But uh, uh, I think uh, there's a, there's this um, terminology used called uh, false consciousness. Um, which arises from Karl Marx, but he didn't actually use that terminology himself. And uh, I think it speaks to this question, false consciousness um, basically means people are unable, people, people being unable to recognize inequality, oppression and exploitation in a capitalist society because of the prevalence within it of views that naturalize and legitimize the existence of social classes. And uh, and for me, it's always been an important thing. I think, to be honest, um, Kuma downplays that aspect in the sense that we're speaking about the consciousness, class consciousness has been natural um, about classes respecting their interest. But um, in that point, like for example, speaking about the idea of the silent majority that brought about by the um, the capitalist class in uh, the United States, um, that ideas. The control of ideas is super important in 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 this uh, in class struggle, and the class naturally that has the dominance in um, the uh, dominance in the of the state, you know, and the economic uh, means of production, is able to control the media, is able to control so many things, and as as well we have things like religion, as you have mentioned, the education system. So it is not something to be underplayed at all. It is not necessarily natural that the classes, of course it's natural, but you have to, within the context of a battle of ideas, battle of um, you know, control of the, the means of ideas. And this is why it's always important to look at someone like Gramsci, who really emphasized this point about an a hegemony that the, the ruling class exerts. Um, particularly through means like religion and the fact that to counteract it requires a strong emphasis on on political education, popular education, um, and the organization of the working class is also important because where the working class is concentrated into, you know, like factories and industrial capitalism, they, are, they become more able to organize and um, join together and be able to develop their class consciousness. Whereas when it is fragmented and divided, in the case where it is less industrial, there's less possibility for that kind of organized working class to, to have the ability to counter, you know, to, to develop his class consciousness strongly in counter to all that is going on. So we have to be aware of that. In, and we also must always be aware of the classes that people who speak on behalf, supposedly, of the oppressed represent because people always come up with middle class ideas, they're influenced by it, the so-called petty bourgeois vacillating ideas, and they, they they then they say that they are fighting for the people. So terminology even like saying the people, which classes are you talking about? Which classes do you represent? Who struggle are you after? Those are very important in developing in fact in, the, in enabling the development of class consciousness because if we just have a, a vague ideas like people who are, or, you know, it, it's, it's how you start to diffuse the class consciousness. We're just all together, kind of thing. This is going to take me very much into the next question I want to ask, um, which is, uh, the, actually, this part now, I think this is, we have spoken to this. I'm going to kind of skip this, which is you know, what I just spoke about. The working class is far from silent, is vocal in its demand for the radical transformation of society. I think we've addressed that. So I just want to move on because of time to the last question. Uh, is it correct or not to use the phrase African socialism or other alternatives like Africanism? Um, 
and that relates to what I was just saying about we have to be very careful with our terminology. So um like to yeah so does anyone want to, and in reference to that as we spoke about African socialism or socialist Africa that was in reference to a book written by A.M. Babu who, who, who wrote you know who actually worked in Tanzania you know Tanzania being um the leader of Tanzania someone who popularized the phrase African socialism though I don't think he is one of those whom Kuma was referring to when he speaks of the African bourgeoisie using such phraseology to um to deceive people but uh um Babu served in the government of Tanzania and actually wrote a book calling for what he calls socialist Africa so does does anyone want to come in this question Anybody? Maybe I have not phrased the <laughs> question properly, but I'm speaking in terms of the phrases we use and and how they they should denote um, class in in importance in terms of building class consciousness. Like I gave the example of using the word people, for example. Mm. So now, if we use the word African socialism, what does it imply that we're saying? And what can we even say are the dangers of that, if there are dangers? Hello? Yes, please. Yes, uh, the way I believe uh, Nkrumah uses it is, uh, is to warn us on uh, that uh, like I these... Uh, is on do now having network issues i wonder if anybody can hear me hey, no no go ahead GD. i think someone else wanted to come in but they'll come after you go ahead okay yes because yeah our positions are historically uh, determined and uh, its uh, principles are universal well now the particularities of a place uh, of, of, of any particular place and its context is uh, Hello. Uh, may may differ, but uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, facts like uh, how uh, one class must uh, oppress other classes and whatnot uh, is uh, is uh, is a uh, is, uh, is a historical and uh, fundamental uh, uh, statement. So I think he wants us to stray from a uh, idealistic or uh, utopian uh, notions of uh, of uh, socialism. And uh, the next speaker can go on. And, uh, um, um, thank you very much, Comrade GD. Um, you know, from from my from my own view, I, I feel like you know what um, Nkrumah was trying to say is just that you know what we find presently today is just that you know there have been a lot of disparities among um the so-called Pan-Africanists, and you know. A lot of people, when they talk about socialism or when they talk about, you know, African socialism, you know, they tend to talk about, you know, how we used to practice things back in in the African, you know, in the African way back in the ancient time, whereby you know, communalism, you know, togetherness and things like that. You know, you know, but people have to understand that, you know, we have to move, you know, into a larger, you know, more aspect. You know, the production forces have to move. Because as of today, you know, you know, we can't go back into an agrarian economy whereby people have to keep farming with, with farms and holes and things like that. So, you know, we are in the stage of industrialization today. And, you know, you know when we're talking about in the industries, you know, factories are coming to play. And under a capitalist society, you know, we see that, you know, the, the so-called factories, or let me say, you know, the industrialization is being controlled in the hands of these few so-called African bourgeoisie, or let me say, um, the African bourgeoisie that work, you know, in the so-called global capitalist system, you know, and I, and I like we find ourselves today, you know, people don't like to talk about scientific socialism, and people always feel as if socialism is not, 
is is not uh, a universal thing. It 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 tends to see socialism as 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 a Western philosophy or things like that. You know what 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 we check, you know, in the world today globally. You know, we can see the structure of class. You know, divisions of class. You know, it's over everywhere, and you know. Socialism just you know come you know like that you know from a thing uh, or things like that. Populism come from the contradiction of capitalism itself, because we see how people are people are able to use you know the means of production. So right now, what we are actually saying in this, in a scientific way is how we can be able to use the means of production you know in the interest of the people. So that is that is where scientific you know socialism comes to play, and you know when people talk about African way of life you know people still want to practice capitalism in a way people still want to exploit their own brothers but we we don't want that relationship anymore we want that relationship to change whereby you know the you know the people or the social labor you know have to work in the interest of people in general that is when we talk about scientific revolution right? the people's interest has to come into play so that's my own contribution Okay, I can come in, please. Um, when I hear African socialism, you know, it, it just sounds uh, similar, you know, to uh, when I hear, uh, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. I think that's another narrative that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, was really pushing. Understand? So I would simply just see African socialism as, you know. Uh, uh, the socialist, uh, uh, you know, structure of society being applied to the African context, you know, that's when um, the the people own the means of production and make use of it to, you know, their own benefits, but mostly within, you know, an African context. You understand that as a, a let's say if it's a development, if it's a, a, a trade. If it's engineering, science, you know, even the cultural aspects would all be uh, tuned towards, um, you know, the, the local context. Um, I'm not well versed enough to, you know, speak in detail about how that would express itself. But, you know, that's how I understand it. But when I hear Africanism, you know, I just think, I just uh, uh, think that that's, that's more like the, the, the cultural aspect of, of doing things. And it doesn't even uh, necessarily connect with uh, socialism. Africanism might just be, you know, a, a, a way of doing something that has what is believed to be like a, a, an African style to it, or an African, a, a, an African way of reasoning. You know, however, <clears throat> however, that can be, you know, uh, uh, expressed. You know, Africanism. I'm just seeing it as a word by itself, and it's not even connected to. Uh, 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 you know, socialism or, or, or pan-Africanism as a whole. So that's my contribution. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, Can I comment? Yeah, go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah, for me, I think... Uh, on uh, the context in which... Uh, having some background audio, I can't hear you so well. Go ahead. Still not working well. Now it's it's faint. Is it better now? Yeah, now better. Okay, I say it depends on the context in which the term is used. Uh, because socialism itself, um, I don't think it lends itself to, or it's kind of, it's lends itself to any race. It's an ideology uh, that uh, caters to the needs of a certain class, the oppressed class. So if there is uh, going to be a term called uh, uh, African socialism, I think it has to do, go, uh, has to do with, um, you know, contextualizing social socialism um, in, a, in a in a given society in Af uh, in a in a society in Africa where there is a uh, you know with this uh, new day um, 
imperialism, approaches to crutch um, well-meaning um, African states, you know, whereby, you know, we grant some, um, we grant some, uh, like, like, like China, for example, where they say they practice um, state capitalism, where most of the industries are being controlled by the state, you know. But well, I don't think African socialism actually has a definition per se, you know. It can vary within in different contexts to different states in Africa that wants to adopt the term, you know, well, because uh, we cannot actually practice socialism in its full um, in a full state because of the you know uh, different um, um, attacks from the imperialist blocks and their puppets in Africa here, you know. So I. <laughs> like Commodore Tobon said, I'm just trying to give my opinion. I'm not so well vast in the, uh, you know, on the topic and how to actually give me, uh, articulate um, my meaning properly. But I, I, what I'll say is, in closing, is that uh, socialism is socialism. There is no such thing. But if there's going to be such a thing, it has to be explained as to why it is being called that, you know. So that would be my contribution. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, I, I think uh, that, um, yeah, it's not the one or all. And I think Nkrumah, you know, himself um, states, I'll go back to that now, um, that in the question of, it's not about the question of context. So go back to that, Nkuma says, of course, there is no hard and fast dogma for socialist revolution and specific contextual circumstances guide the application of socialism. However, the principles of socialism are universal and involve the genuine socialization of productive and distributive processes. Those who, for political reasons, pay lip service to socialism while aiding and abetting imperialism and neo-colonialism serve bourgeois class interests. Um, so, uh, so I think with that kind of phrase, you can see, like I said earlier, that someone like Inyeri who used the, the phrase, is not someone you will consider to be paying lip service to socialism, but uh, you you have people who do jump on this who did at that time jump on this bandwagon to, to, to claim that and and again Nkrumah actually discusses this at the beginning of the book to show how important it is to him that those who there are those who try to claim that Africa was um originally socialist so you know after independence we just simply need to to just go back to our roots and do the things the way Africans used to do it. It's just simply a way to deny that there is class struggle, um, to also deny the reality of imperialism. I think very importantly, as, as in the comments I've made, that imperialism is an important part of understanding, you know, this idea about <laughs> why the term terminology is important. Uh, I think even for someone like A.M. Babu, who wrote this book, uh, African socialism or socialist Africa, he, in his own opinion, it was that the African leaders uh, were acting as if imperialism was not significant. Um, so that you can, you must take account of imperialism in trying to develop whatever policies you, you want to develop in your in in your context. Um, so. Uh, the key thing is not to use for me. The key thing is not to is not that the sociology by itself is bad. Is that if it is just by itself and the policies that you articulate going beyond phraseology do not speak to that and do not enlighten people and have a class, um, yeah, working class, you know, uh, interests that you are not specifying, you know, the class nature of. The, the what you are what you are fighting for then it, it will become a problem and so yes we do have people now it's all about it's africanism we don't want to hear socialism people do say this a lot and it's it's a cover they do use this as a cover to try and perpetuate 
um, capitalist ideas. It is different from me from saying that maybe something like the Chinese Communist Party, which maintains a name but practices in practice operates, um, they would say capitalism. You know, it's it's different because it, it depends on what what you are you are claiming, you 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 represent. Um, it's not, uh, you know, that it's clear and the classes that you represent are clear, but people do this African socialism will tell you, for example, that they, no, all classes are the same, we're all the same, we're all Africans. And now, that's, that's the danger, we're all Africans, regardless of class. And, we, um, and uh, so, you know, even we use the, the phrase Pan-Africanism, and even when we started this uh, organization, we had to make it clear in our, in explaining what Pan-Africanism means, uh, as as Comrade Obiom has put there, like this thing about cultural Pan Africanism versus revolutionary Pan Africanism, we had to actually make it clear because we know that people who say they are Pan Africanists, many of them, some of them would say they are not socialist or it's just essentially a cover. So we we, we make it very clear on our, you know about us and our, and our principles that we are socialists and that we are not cultural Pan Africanists as such. We are revolutionary Pan Africanists. So so again, we, you know we had to choose to use the word revolutionary pan-africanism to define ourselves to make it clear um what we are about and i think any organization no matter what the physiology that doesn't make an attempt to make it clear what it stands for is is really there to deceive to deceive people it's paying lip service um and it doesn't have the interest of the, the majority class at heart um uh, I also, I think, yeah, I think just going through what comments, I think um, Walter said that uh, Africa today exists under mostly capitalist and neo-colonialist relationship. The only way to get out of this is knowing the rules of the game with clarity. So it should be socialist Africa. So I think, yes, this is the point I was trying to make earlier about this is imperialism is important and why we have to make clear what exactly it is that we are that we are um so we say we are we are, we are it's just similar in the way Nkuma says that during the fight against imperialism people turned into so it became a race thing so people were not looking at their own oppressive oppressing class you know so now it becomes the case if we use phraseology like african you know and saying that we are all the same we start to lose focus in terms of the class that that continues to oppress us on behalf of the imperialist um and uh comment on bioma says right often these other terms are used to deflect from the centrality of class struggle so yes um so those, those are the 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 issues does anybody else want to come in um so it's not thank everyone very much for coming and for contributing it's a great discussion um like you said earlier we'll be sharing this you know on um our youtube or other social media so we can get other people to um yeah so other people to get in, you know um uh, to get to know about these books, to get to encourage them to read them, to be aware of them. So, uh, which is why we do this. We'll continue next time. I think someone wants to come in. You can go ahead if you want. I'm not sure who that is, to be honest. Um, let me... mm. If anybody wants to come, do go ahead. I think someone is trying to come in. Um, so again, uh, do, do get in touch with us if you'd like to join me, if you haven't already, you can check us out on uh, movementforafricanemancipation.org, uh, check us out on um, our Twitter, Rise for Freedom, Facebook, Movement for African Emancipation, send us a message, we'll get in touch. Uh, Next uh, week, next time, we'll be looking at uh, chapter four, class and race. 
uh, and maybe also chapter five elitism depending on how much time it's going to involve um yeah and uh yeah so comrade Obama, thank you very much for you know for coming again thanks for your support and for being here um yes uh Sengo, Leopold Sengo was claiming was and we didn't actually look at the uh Mkuma's discussion of negritude i i didn't decide to skip that because it's kind of fairly historical and i think african socialism is more current for us but uh the, the whole issue of negritude was come up with by Sengo. um and this is a part of the kind of use of, of these strategies that we were used to essentially to deceive and, and to um ignore class essentially um so yes thanks uh, anyone there's more last chance for if anybody wants to come in all right so uh, there yes maybe okay <laughs> i i think you know, i mean i think single definitely used it i'm not sure yeah go ahead is it today no, I was just typing. Yeah. I didn't have much to say on negative. Yeah, I think you're right. But I, I remember the name Sengo with regards to it anyway. But uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong. But yes, I think certainly African socialism too. I think that's what uh, Komodo Vyama was, was referring to anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day or evening, wherever you are. I'll see you next time. All right. Good day, or good evening, everyone. Thank you for hosting this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Right.